give me a round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, nice, nice. Thank you so much. Uh, so my name is David Ann Romero. I'm a Mexican-American spoken word artist. I've performed at over 75 colleges and universities in 34 different states, and I am so honored to be here with you this evening. Please give a round of applause for Sigma, Kappa Delta, for Heather Fitch, uh, for the sound uh, crew, technical crew, putting this, uh, putting this all together. Yes, round of applause for all those people. For all the community members who showed up to make this uh, special evening. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and launch into this presentation, The Latinx Giant, what the demographic shift means for the future of American politics, economics, and culture. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and kick this off. So I am a spoken word artist, a poet. So I'm going to kick this off with a poem. Um, I heard that here in Texas, Y'all like football. Is that true? Yeah. All right, all right. See, I, I knew it was dangerous. I knew it was dangerous. Andrew, you're always going to keep back All right, so uh, this first poem is about football. It's a story of an undocumented student uh, athlete. It takes place uh, during an event called the East LA Classic, uh, which is a celebration of the communities of East LA and Boyle Heights. Um, so here we go. When life throws everything at you, don't drop the ball. Don't drop the ball. Blue, 42, set, hike. A brown quarterback's fingers tighten around the white laces of a football. Roosevelt versus Garfield may meet today upon an annual battleground where local legends about rivalry, defensive and offensive formations. Upon this old field, in this dirty stadium, football sounds a lot like Boyle Heights, like East LA, like years of pride and history. Sounds like Roosevelt is in motion, number 42, Miguel is with them, crossing the line of swimming, black and red and yellow. His muscles tell a story. Miguel has always been running, running from La Liga, Las Vacas, everyone who wants to stop him. Ask him, don't miss on those papelas. Where are your papers? Miguel's too fast though. How fast? Too fast. Too fast for borders, laws, checkpoints, dogs. Too fast for fences, ditches, detention centers, and walls. Definitely too fast for the fool. Unfortunate enough to be deemed up on it now. Through it all, under the glare of stadium lights, past the cheering, booing, chanting, and screaming to amaze the players. Focus gave him purpose. Miguel will be fine by this moment. He knows this. No college will recruit him. His record doesn't really scream draft pick, but that's not the issue. Miguel never cared for politics. He just loved his coach, his team, this American game of football, history, to make a catch in the only important game that he could. Miguel will not score the winning touchdown. This game will be added to a losing record that will make for a losing season. There are so many reasons for Miguel to drop the ball. Walk out of the stadium, just another statistic. Undocumented student, faceless, immigrant. There are so many reasons for Miguel to drop the ball. So as his fire is towards him, carrying the weight of a future of battle, he repeats to himself like a prayer. Don't drop the ball. Don't drop the ball. So he catches it like how he catches his diploma, like how he catches his degree, like how he catches the hand of his high school sweetheart. They cross the threshold of that whole life together. He cradles the ball in his arms like his son John, firstborn legal, firstborn free to pursue his dreams and not always be running. So, Dan, on. This is just one story from the East LA class. Roosevelt versus Garfield. Just one game for Miguel of a doctor football. Thank you. All right, let's kick things off. Next slide. All right, so first off, we're going to get into some territory here. So the purpose of this presentation is to give a brief overview 
of uh, certain terms and of the history of both Hispanic and Latinx people in the United States. So there's the question, Hispanic or Latinx? Now these words are very often used interchangeably. I may use them interchangeably throughout this presentation, but they do mean two different things. Uh, next slide. So the history of the term Hispanic is tied into the period of Spanish colonialism of the Americas. So that included, as you can see, all the way up to uh, current day Alaska, all the way down south through Central and South America to the southernmost cone of Argentina. Now, you see that area in red, there's a, a, a large missing area right there, and that is uh, mostly the current nation state of Brazil. Brazil was uh, uh, colonized by the Portuguese, so that's why they speak Portuguese there. So they are generally not uh, interpreted as being Hispanics. So people from these regions in the red, including Spain, uh, Spaniards, modern day Spaniards, could also be uh, included in this definition of Hispanic. We share a common culture uh, very often. We are uh, come from a Roman Catholic background. Uh, we mostly speak Spanish. Um, and there are a few other identifying cultures. Our, our cuisine is most often very similar. And uh, yeah, that's most of them. Uh, next slide, please. But the term Latinx, so the term Latinx has a different meaning. So it derives from, so you see the current uh, U.S.-Mexico border, although some argue that uh, it defines uh, further north and includes people in the American Southwest as well, people who, whose indigenous origins, roots from this area up north, once again, all the way through uh, Central and Southern America, include uh, Brazil. Uh, so people with any indigenous origins that trace back to these parts of the continents. Um, and it also includes people from the Caribbean as well. Next slide. Um, now people have argued, so Latinx is the gender-inclusive uh, version of this word. So this includes, so for example, let's say this, um, the Spanish language is a gendered language. There are male objects and female objects. And very often uh, in the past, when we would refer to uh, a group, a mix, a group of people of mixed genders, uh, we would say it used a blanket term Latino. Now in the 1990s through the 2000s, people started to think that this was a, a problematic issue and that in order to address people of mixed genders uh, within a, a singular group, that we should use a gender neutral uh, suffix. So they added Latinx. They created this term Latinx. Now there are a number of criticisms of this term. And in fact, uh, its origins are mostly rooted in the United States. So um, I'll go over another term in the next couple of slides that might be a little less uh, problematic. Uh, next slide. But the reason why the X was chosen uh, to add on to this term Latino is because there were indigenous cultures, mostly in Mexico, uh, in the state of Oaxaca, that were already using the X in order to refer to uh, groups of mixed gender. Next slide. So yes, yeah, so the term that a lot of people are starting to use as well, uh, especially throughout uh, Latin America, is Latin. So this idea of adding an E in there uh, to replace the traditional O's or A's in the Spanish language. Next slide. All right, so also I promise in the description of this program to provide context, what, what does this Chicana, Chicano, Chicanese mean? Well, these are people uh, who are Mexican-American. These are people who are either first generation, second generation, third, fourth, and some of us go back maybe even five generations back into the past, of uh, having roots uh, in, this, uh, in, in these states. Uh, next slide. So yeah, so the term Chicano, once again, it means, or Chicanis, uh, means uh, Mexican-American. It means uh, Mex people of Mexican ancestry living within the current uh, continent, or within the current boundaries of the United States. And this has roots in the 1960s to the Chicanx movement, figures such as 
six of Chavez, Dolores Huerta. Also pictured up there are uh, Tijerina, uh, uh, Sal Castro is another one, Ruben Salazar, an activist in Los Angeles, Rodolfo, Jorge Gonzalez with this poem, I Am Joaquin. So this was a certain moment in time when people turned this phrase that at once been whitewashed. It was, it was meant to be a derog derogatory term that very often Mexican nationals ascribe to uh, Mexicans living in the United States. They turned this word that had meant something uh, very derisive into a term of empowerment. And it was a political ideology for many of them. Next slide. So yeah, so why is it so important to put a focus on Chicanx in the middle of these Latinx issues? Well, it's because the Mexican Americans are the largest uh, ethnic group of Latinx people within the United States, making up over half, 63%. And our numbers are growing uh, in the greatest number as well. Uh, next slide. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about so this idea of the minority majority nation, explaining what this means and why not to next people are at the forefront of this. Next slide. So we know now that by the year 2044 or earlier, minorities in the United States will make up over half of the population. Uh, so this is the first time in history that this has happened all the way back since the first settlers came and, 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 and before the United States existed from sea to shining sea. Um, so this is the first time since that period uh, that this has been the fact of the uh, demographic makeup of the United States. And it is a very important fact. We know that by this there will become important changes to the politics, the economics, and the culture. And I got asked the other day, why giant? Why do I say the Latinx giant? Well, that uh, refers back to a speech uh, that was given uh, from the Japanese uh, following the attack on Pearl Harbor, when they said, uh, we fear that we have awakened a sleeping giant. And that's how I see the Latinx population in the United States, as a giant that is just beginning to wake up. Next slide. All right, so and also congruent, congruent with, uh, concurrent rather, uh, with this growth of the Latinx population is a decrease in Caucasian uh, populations. Uh, the, the number of births are decreasing, uh, the number of deaths also statistically uh, is increasing. Uh, next slide. And you see here, this, is, uh, this map shows the concentration of Latinx people in the United States. So the areas that are more yellow or orange or brown are brown, uh, such as, as you can uh, refer to us. So you can see the greatest concentration there is in the American Southwest. It's in California, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas. Now you'll see populations uh, mostly Cuban, Dominican, uh, Puerto Rican, Florida. Also there are historic populations in the American Northeast uh, that are very similar to that. Also a lot of uh, Spaniard uh, immigrants, Spanish immigrants from Spain. Um, also in Illinois, that's another uh, area with historic Mexican and Puerto Rican populations. Uh, next slide. So the reason why the American Southwest has become such a perfect uh, melting pot for, uh, for our culture, for our people to come into is because we have roots here. Um, so these states were in fact once part of Mexico and they were seated after the Mexican-American War ended in 1848. So there has been a very natural basis in culture uh, uh, here. Uh, for, for uh, uh, immigrant populations to continue to uh, enter and to grow. Uh, next slide. Uh, so yeah, within my own family's history, so I'm very light-skinned uh, for a Mexican. I'm Mexican myself, Chicano. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, we do have roots here in my family. Uh, so these are, this is uh, my great, great, my great grandfather and great grandmother uh, Cemetery in Domiciana Romero, which uh, they, they lived in New Mexico. They were actually both Romeros, so <laughs> before they got married. So they were actually something like fourth or fifth cousins 
it's a whole thing in New Mexico. But uh, yeah, so they were actually both born in a period when uh, New Mexico was part of Mexico. And then their great grandparents, or you know, their grandparents, great grandparents were here when it was part of Spain, and then before that when it was indigenous land. Uh, next slide. Um, and of course, the peoples of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico uh, has actually been in U.S. territory since 1898, I believe, and it was ceded in the Spanish uh, American War. And Puerto Ricans are naturally born citizens of the United States. Next slide. But unfortunately, uh, Puerto Ricans lack the ability to vote, so there are ongoing efforts. Uh, to uh, increase representation for Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico, giving them uh, this ability to engage in our American democracy. Next slide. Yeah, so it's very important to remember uh, throughout all these, all these different populations coming in that, that are coming in for a piece of the American dream, uh, even throughout the pandemic. Uh, next slide. All right, so this, uh, this poem that I'm going to read is called Letters Across Borders, and it deals with a lot of these historic issues that I've been talking about, about the border and the Mexican-American War, uh, through the lens of uh, a number of letters being exchanged. Dear U.S., I've noticed you've been putting up a lot of walls lately. We used to be close. Partners. Dear Israel, I notice you've been putting up a lot of walls lately. We used to be close, my child. Dear U.S., we were born in fire and blood, screaming for independence from oppressive progenitors in a new world. I was 300 years in the belly of the beast, you nearly 200. But our fates, like my liberation from Maximilian, the decision of your civil war are connected. Dear Israel, I am very, very old, but I can still remember how you twice owned my deserts, first as lost and lonely infant, your birth name and those who pass over, nomads, wanderers. I did not raise you easy, kept you moving. Like my other children, I raised you to be a survivor. Dear U.S., all of these battles, these forces and cannons, the bloody war between us are merely the imprints of tiny feet leaving scars upon our bodies. Dear Israel, you return from Egypt, confident yet desperate, eager to drink from my wells. I gave you the open desert. You wanted to build walls, but the Romans still knew you as my child. Dear U.S., our relationship is timeless. For millennia, we have been connected. We have danced our dance in an inseparable embrace upon continental plates, shifting the oceans, but not us. We are one. Dear Israel, you fled to Europe, came to greet you with open deserts. You have returned to build walls. Dear U.S., we now carry two names. We carry these fences. These walls, this border, dear Israel, you wage war with your brothers, push forward your borders, you deny my name, my child, my poor lost Hebrew, my poor lost Israel. You have a home now built atop corpses and conquest, a home of checkpoints and fences built atop the womb from which I gave birth to you. Dear U.S., it's like you're trying to forget all that we've meant to each other. I know now that you created NAFTA to take and take without giving anything back in return. Dear Israel, you remain as lost as you ever have been. Your heart is still afraid. It is still wandering. I fear for us. I fear for you. Dear U.S., you put up these walls. You build up your walls. My ear is pressed against your chest. I wonder when I will once again feel your heart's beat. Dear U.S. and Israel, we do not ask you to leave each other, only that you please return to us. Sincerely, Mexico and Palestine.
Thank you. All right, next slide. All right, so we're going to discuss some factors driving immigrants into the United States. Next slide. So yes, uh, so in talking about Latinx immigrants coming to the United States, it's very similar to any immigrant population anywhere. Um, there are push and pull factors. So it could be whether it's environmental destruction, looking for jobs, escaping war, um, seeking economic opportunities, uh, uh, less restrictive laws, uh, whatever it might be, there are so many different factors. Uh, next slide. Um, so yeah, um, so along with the changing demographic um, in discussing that uh, Latinx people make up roughly over a third of the United States population by 2044, uh, we're expected to make up about a quarter of the documented uh, uh, workforce at the same time. So we will have increased uh, representation in labor. Uh, next slide. Um, so yeah, also to discuss, uh, so I'd like to mix in personal stories with all of this. So in talking about immigrant stories and coming to the United States, so on my mother's side of the family, uh, this is my great-grandmother, Rafaela Puente, and uh, her daughter, uh, my, my grandmother, uh, Benita. And they um, were alive at a time when the Mexican Revolution was just beginning to start. Uh, next slide. And this was a time in which there would be traveling uh, groups of soldiers, at first very disorganized into different groups, traveling through the countryside, waging a battle, having a skirmish here, a skirmish there. And very often in times of war, uh, people are displaced. People are taken from their homes, sometimes they're robbed, their possessions are taken, whether it be from people on the right side or the wrong side of the conflict. The civilians very often get caught in the crossfire. And so my, grand, my great grandmother was terrified of having her daughter conscripted into the army as either an Adelita or a soldadera, serving the soldiers uh, in the Mexican Revolution. And so what she would do is she would put her, she would hide her into a laundry basket when they came along and sometimes maybe have to stay in there for hours uh, at a time. Uh, next slide. Uh, but there have also been, to uh, fast forward through time, in the 20th century, uh, a number of other events drove people from Latin America, uh, specifically from South America, up north, further into Central America, and sometimes into the United States. So there were, was a history of uh, CIA-backed coups throughout Latin America through the 50s and the 70s. Next slide. So for example, there was uh, one uh, operation called Operation Condor. It was organized in November of 1975. And it was an agreement between a number of different nations, some of which, uh, whose military dictators had been graduates of the School of the Americas, uh, which was a CIA-backed uh, military operation uh, that operated and is now known as WinSec. Uh, but anyways, as part of Operation Condor, uh, you had Augusto uh, Pinochet, who is depicted there on the left, uh, from Chile, uh, 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 Stress, stress though, uh, out of Paraguay, and uh, Fidel uh, out of Argentina, and many other uh, uh, dictators who came together to be a campaign of extreme repression against their own people. 60,000 are estimated to have been murdered, 400,000 uh, in prison throughout all of this. And all for the most part to make sure that American interests uh, in South America uh, were protected. Next slide. Also in El Salvador, um, so a big cause of immigration to the United States in the 80s and the 90s of Salvadorians uh, was a result of the uh, Civil War in El Salvador, which lasted 12 years. Uh, 75,000 people perished in this conflict. Roughly 1% 
of the nation of El Salvador uh, uh, died in this conflict. So to think about uh, a country with a population, I believe only around 75 million in this time, to very, very significant numbers, uh, this conflict between this right-wing party and this left-wing party, which left many, many dead and many uh, displaced. Uh, next slide. Also in the 90s, you saw the rise of something of NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement. And this had a profound effect specifically on the state of Mexico. Uh, later in the 2000s, you had NAFTA, which was the Central American version of NAFTA. Um, it had a similar effect, which I'll discuss in the next slide. Uh, next slide. All right, so what, what effect did these economic policies have on the people of Mexico and Central America. Well, what they did is they compromised most of their farmers. So very similar to here in the Dust Bowl, how that paved the way for uh, agribusinesses to come, out, come in and buy up a lot of American farms and displace a lot of American farmers. NAFTA and NAFTA had similar effects throughout Latin America. And what this did is this drove most of the farmers uh, northward towards El Norte. Uh, next slide. So in Mexico, you saw a great resistance to this in the nation state of Chiapas. Uh, in Chiapas, they still had an effect, this uh, system called the Ejido system, which was where uh, land was owned communally. And this communal land was suddenly freed up for private enterprise, driving a lot of people off of their land. A lot of people became homeless uh, very quickly because they could not compete uh, with these agribusinesses encroaching upon uh, their crops and their land. Uh, so in Chiapas, you saw an armed resistance to this of the Zapatistas in 1994, the same year that NAFTA was signed into action. Next slide. Um, of course, the drug war in Mexico has displaced many uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people have been driven. Uh, and there have been uh, many, many murders as a result of this, of the corruption, of the crime, of the bloodshed. Uh, next slide. One of the only things that I can say as a result uh, or, or that has fed into this here in the United States would be the prohibition of certain drugs. Uh, a chief among them that you can see depicted there are marijuana. Just like in the prohibition in the United States, how uh, it led to the, the, the driving of criminal uh, organizations getting into bootlegging, the glory days of the mob, in Chicago and New York and whatnot, chiefly starting up to produce these, uh, to produce alcohol and create this, uh, uh, this criminal enterprise. So too in Mexico has there been a response uh, to the prohibition of drugs such as marijuana. Next slide. Also, in the recent years, we've seen caravans come up from uh, Mexico, uh, come through Central America and from Mexico. This caravan includes uh, people from Nicaragua and Honduras. And there's really something terrible going on right now is that a lot of these criminal organizations, what they'll do is that they'll kidnap someone and they'll hold them for ransom. Um, so it's really, really terrible and, and, and send them northwards uh, to work off the debt. Um, so it's unfortunate that a lot of these people are driven towards uh, some of the most terrible conditions to come here. United States. Uh, next slide. All right, so this next poem I'm going to read is the story of uh, an undocumented laborer who traveled uh, across uh, from uh, uh, Tijuana to San Diego, and he was beaten by over a dozen Border Patrol agents there at the border. Uh, his name was Anastasio Hernandez Rojas, and this poem is called The Ladder. Tijuana is a ladder. San Diego is a ladder. My name is Anastasio. I know all about climbing ladders. I'm a painter, a roofer. They tell me, coyotes or police, one day I will fall off in streams and shadow, crash 
in bones and blood, I smile. You'll only fall if you look down. We'll only look down if you're too afraid to climb. I've never been afraid. I know all about climbing ladders. I'm a painter, a roofer. This life is a ladder. Tijuana is a ladder. The desert is a run. Parched lips are a run. Dry throat is a run. Blistered feet are a run. Then, hours waiting for work are a run. The bosses are a run. Cheap pay is a run. Ice, la migra, la policia runs. But between the aluminum is a few. Each one more beautiful than the one before it. My kids go to college, never having to spend a day working under the shade. They go to college, they never having to spend a day climbing ladders in the sun. And I find my wife a car and it runs. A new washing machine, a dryer, they run. Hours for the first time. My wife, every child under one roof. They run around this house, this freshly painted house. It shines like the afternoon. It rests at the top of the ladder, and I can see it. I can breathe it. I can taste it. Like when I rise from my work and rest on my haunches. Look out over a roof, see the tiles sitting near completion. A glass jar of money, almost full. I can see it. The border is a ladder, and I am getting closer. With each jog, each crossing, even at night, I will fly. My hands will grasp each one, because I have to, because I am almost there. My hands, hands up, grasp bare, hands up. I fall, hands up, my hands reach out, hands up. They surround on the desert floor more than a dozen black uniforms, shouting figures, malevolent faces illuminated by the glow of tasers, striking like rattlesnakes, they sting and bite. I cringe and cry. Each kick is a run, each baton is a run, each kick is a run, each baton is a run, each kick is a run, each baton is a run. So many runs, the light from the house fades, somewhere over the border is San Diego, but where has the ladder gone? Thank you. Alright, next slide. Alright, so I'm going to take a walk a little bit. Because I'm, I'm getting antsy here. All right, so I'm going to discuss uh, a little bit of civil rights history here in the United States uh, regarding mostly Chicago, Chicago and Chicago populations. So this section is on repression, segregation, and deportation. Now the first slide uh, includes a little bit of a trigger warning. So uh, for anyone uh, who, who might be averse to seeing uh, difficult images, this has a scene here. Uh, next slide. All right, so to start off, to kick things off, I'm talking about civil rights history. So this is following the Mexican-American War here. Uh, there were 597 documented uh, cases of lynchings of Mexican-Americans in the United States. Uh, and they were lynched, we were lynched, at an unprecedented rate of 473 per 100,000 of the population. And the reason why this is so significant is because this is the highest per population percentage in American history. Now, we know the important history of African Americans in the South under Jim Crow policies, that these lynchings were conducted over a much longer period of time. And there were many, many, many more uh, who were affected. But for this brief period after the Mexican American War, for 20 years, uh, this was the greatest, this was the height of all lynchings uh, per population. Next slide. There were also acts on the books uh, that made discrimination against Mexican Americans legal. So this is an example in California. This was called the Greaser Act. It's there under Section 2. And what it is, it's, it's a statute that makes it legal basically to uh, racially profile uh, people of Mexican-American 
to say, and that it was actually that it actually used this uh, derogatory term for Mexican American people as greasers. This was one of the old terms that was used uh, uh, to uh, denigrate our population. Uh, next slide. Also, in the 1920s through 50s in the United States, there was something called Operation Wetback. And this was an operation that was aimed to deport uh, illegal immigrants. Unfortunately, as well, at the same time that this was going on, natural born, in some cases, multi-generational uh, Mexican-Americans, Chicanx people, were being deported as well. So once again, in my own family history, I have a great uncle uh, who was uh, multi-generational, and he was deported, and it was this family mystery. Uh, they used to, used to ask, you know, why, why, did he, why did he just decide to leave to Mexico one day? Well, he didn't just decide, he, he was forcibly uh, detained and deported and sent to Mexico. Uh, so yes, many people were affected by Operation Wetback. Uh, next slide. Also in the 1940s and 50s, in the American Southwest, particularly in California, there was de facto segregation. So a lot of times these laws did not exist on the books in the same way that they did in the American South, targeting African Americans, but they did their impact was, was very similar, if not the same. So you can see signs in private businesses that say, we serve whites only, no Spanish or Mexicans. Very often you'll hear Spanish as a term referring to people who are actually Mexican American or Latinx of, of different origins, not from Spain, not literally Spaniards. And as you can see there, there's an apostrophe in the whites. Anyone who knows English, does that, is that apostrophe supposed to be there? No! So what does this tell us? This tells us that racism is dumb. So don't be dumb. Be grammatically correct, yes. All right, so uh, picture there in the middle is uh, Sylvia Mendez. Sylvia Mendez uh, uh, was a school child of, of Puerto Rican and Mexican-American mixed descent. Um, wanted to attend a school that was an all-white school in Orange County, California. And she was prevented uh, from doing this by the Westminster School Board. So this was a historic case in American history called Mendez versus Westminster. And this happened before uh, Brown versus Board of Education. And the reason why uh, this case is not as very often as celebrated in our textbooks is because this case uh, was actually able to be settled at the local court level. However, uh, the case was referred to um, in, in, in the legal documents uh, to set a precedent for Brown versus Board of Education, which then ended uh, racial segregation in schools. So very, very important history. Uh, next slide. And Sylvia Mendes is actually still with us. It still continues to fight a good fight. Uh, so that's pretty great. Next slide. There have also been movements uh, to make the speaking of Spanish illegal. There have been a few laws that have been attempted at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level, in individual schools. Uh, but throughout most of history, this has been uh, done more in a de facto sense as well. But this is actually a picture of an individual uh, uh, a Republican senator who tried to install a law uh, making English the official language of the United States, which would then allow for other uh, laws, more aggressive laws, to be put into uh, uh, law, put into effect, rather, that would prohibit the speaking of Spanish. Um, in various spaces. Uh, next slide. All right, so I'm going to speak about the Latinx market in the United States. So when I mean market, I mean the economy. I mean the, the larger uh, market forces at work. Next slide. All right, so yeah, so I was in the, in the previous section, I had just been speaking about the criminalization or the attempts to criminalize the speaking of, uh, of Spanish in certain spaces. But in irony of all of this is throughout my research, I found 
that the first uh, uh, first Spanish media in the United States was a newspaper called La Prensa. That was actually started here in Texas in San Antonio, and it was started by uh, right wing uh, 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 politicians and business leaders who were fleeing the Mexican Revolution, and it was their outlet to uh, to talk trash. <laughs> to basically criticize uh, the, the leaders of the Mexican Revolution. So, what I find very interesting a lot of times in contemporary American pol political debates, we think of the speaking of Spanish or the opening up of Spanish as being a left wing issue, but actually the first precedent uh, for this uh, was, was driven by uh, right wing supporters. Uh, next slide. Um, and also to follow along with this, in speaking about Texas and media, there was an Asparaga, Asparaga family. And these were very, and continued to be, they're, they're a dynasty. They're a dynasty in the way that the TV show Dynasty was a dynasty. That Dallas was a dynasty. That uh, the show Empire is a dynasty. So this is a fascinating family involved in media. Next slide. Uh, what they did is that they traveled back and forth between Mexico and the United States and what they discovered that while there was a geopolitical border that they could go over it back and forth through the airways, that they could communicate with the various populations throughout Latin America through media, through satellite and cable television. And they created networks that would communicate back and forth and they realized that if they could communicate back and forth, they could sell ad space. And if they could sell ad space, they could promote products. They could create a market uh, across Latin America for various goods. Uh, next slide. So these various uh, efforts led into the establishment of the television station Univision. Uh, next slide which then also paved the way for Telemundo. Telemundo was started by Puerto Ricans as well, uh, Puerto Rican uh, business people, as well as uh, people with uh, CBS, by um, um, and then carries a different uh, uh, character from Univision, which is very Mexican in character. Uh, next slide. So yes, as I was talking about, so television and advertising, media advertising, made it possible to promote these goods and to build up uh, an economy of goods throughout Latin America and throughout the Spanish-speaking people in the United States. For us to have our own way of communicating with each other, our own culture, to the point where a lot of these products have entered into the American uh, markets and not just in separate stores, but are carried in mainstream stores. A lot of the brands that once seemed very foreign, very exotic, um, are now becoming a lot more recognizable. Um, and also another effect, counter effect of this, has been uh, cultural appropriation. So you can see on the bottom a few examples, maybe there's a, a Chipotle under there, a Moe's, uh, a Qdoba, uh, a few examples. Uh, Taco Bell, of course, is another one. Of American corporations uh, finding ways to uh, sample the, the, the flavors of Latinx cuisine and reproduce them for the American market. Uh, next slide. Also, something historic. So we're talking about all these networks of these television stations and these radio, sta uh, radio stations and marketing to Spanish language audiences. Just recently, there have first appeared the first ads in Spanish um, in mainstream American markets. So here, on your major networks, your Fox, your CBS, your NBC, you know, on and on and on, appear uh, these commercials in Spanish, with Spanish music playing, uh, Spanish being advertised, and we saw a wide variety of Latinx people uh, depicted of different skin tones, different nationalities, uh, uh, different abilities, different genders. Um, so this was a huge break from the past in which uh, generally light-skinned uh, Latinx people were favored who fit very conventional uh, uh, stereotypes. Uh, next slide. All right, so that being said, uh, talking about all this history of selling things, I'm going to sell you something now. I'm going to sell you on my favorite food, 
and that is cheese enchiladas. Now, before I perform this poem, I am going to have to get a drink here. Fuck. 